Thank you, Suzanne. It's always a pleasure to be with such a wonderful soul. Appreciate you. After dying in a car crash, what a great way to start. <laughs> After dying in a cr car crash, three friends go to heaven for orientation. They were all asked the same question. When you are in the casket, friends and family are mourning over you, what would you like to hear them say about you? The first guy immediately responds, I would like to hear them say that I was one of the greatest doctors of my time and a great man. The second guy says, I would like to hear them say that I was a wonderful husband and school teacher who made a huge difference in our children for tomorrow. The third guy thinks a minute and replies, I'd like to hear them say, look, he's moving. <laughs> Sounds about right. At the beginning of the year, the board got together in, in uh, taking a look at whether there was something specific that we would like to focus on this year. We came up with this idea that Sheree has shared with us before about exploring the collective consciousness. And I'd like to spend some time today sharing some thoughts about what that might actually be, what that actually might mean, because I'm going to suggest to us that this is the direction in which the human race is heading. We're heading we've gone through a period of tribal awareness where our identity was, I'm my tribe. Uh, we've gone, since in the last 500 years, we've, I, we've developed a new sense of awareness which we call individual consciousness, I'm my own person. It's just me, I don't need anybody else. But what happens when we get to the end of that is the opportunity is to move into we consciousness. I am not just this individual person, I am humanity. So I want to talk a little bit today uh, a little bit, it's a little bit of a history lesson, so for those of you who don't like the, the right brain kind of stuff, you can go to sleep for this part. But we're going to end up doing an experience, we're going to have an experience of what the collective consciousness might actually be. Because what we don't know yet, because it's, we, can see, we can see that it's coming, but where most of us aren't there yet, we don't know what that experience actually is. Or we think we don't know, but I'm going to point out how we actually have been experiencing how the collective consciousness is alive and well and acting in our lives. We're just not aware of it. So um, to give us a sense of, to start out this, we're going to start out with just a sense of our congregation. Now, how many of you remember the survey we did earlier this year when we asked everybody how many years you've spent in New Thought or Unity? So for those of you who weren't here, we asked the, our congregation to fill out a form and say, how many years have you been studying New Thought or how many years do you consider yourself a true student? And then we added up all the individual uh, years that people had, uh, had, uh, had uh, written down, and it came up to over 2,000. So just imagine that we're sitting in a room of 2,000 years of new thought experience. And as Cherie pointed out, when we, 2,000 years is pretty much takes us back to the time of, of Jesus the Christ. So we also asked ourselves, uh, and we've, we've shared this among ourselves uh, many, many times, is what brought us to unity? Why are we here? Why did we come in the first place? And for many of us, uh, we came because something was going on in our lives that wasn't working, and we wanted to find a better way. We wanted to find solutions to our problems. Some of us had physical challenges, uh, facing uh, serious disease, possibly even something someone told us it was incurable. Remember, that's how the unity started with Myrtle Fillmore. She, had, she was told she had tuberculosis, it wasn't curable, and somehow that it got cured. Uh, some people have financial challenges, perhaps even bankruptcy, financial ruin. Uh, many of us were having challenges with our relationships. It could be with our spouse, with our children, with people at the office. Um, and we wanted to find something that would help us solve these problems. Some people came to New Thought because they were, weren't finding anything powerful or uh, provocative in their own churches, and they wanted to find something better. Um, and some people may even had have may even already have had a deep contact with God, and they wanted to make it even deeper. So they found their way. We all found our way to new thought. And whatever drew us here, we found answers. Those of us who found the answers kept keep coming back because we want to master the uh, methodology and the practices that Unity and New Thought and others teach so that we become the answers. We're not simply getting answers, we become those answers. We want to master the, the methodologies that, that Unity and New Thought uh, offer us. 
And so for 2,000 years, think about this, look around the room, for 2,000 years, all of us have been practicing the five unity principles, which are there's only one presence and one power, active as the universe, in the universe, and in my life, God the good. Secondly, our essence, as Suzanne said in, our, in her meditation, is of God. Therefore, we are inherently God, we are inherently good. And this God essence was fully expressed and manifest in Jesus the Christ, who, now, who, created, who created the way to show us how all of us can have the same experience. Third, we're co-creators with God, creating reality through the thoughts held in mind. Fourth, through prayer and meditation, we align our heart-mind with God-heart-mind. And the tools that we use are denials, affirmations, and meditation. And the fifth is, through our thoughts, our words, and actions, we create our world and we live the truth that is inside. So again, you think about all of this work that we've been doing some people have been doing this for 30, 40 years in this room. Some people have just started. But again, accumulatively, it's 2,000 years of experience. So it might be time for us to ask the question, is this going anywhere? Is this leading to something? We're putting time and energy. We have been putting time and energy, two millennia worth of time and energy. And for some of us, in our own individual lives, we have, have the experience of going somewhere. We have the experience of arriving at a level of peace and freedom in which we get to express ourselves fully. But as Peggy Lee said, is that all there is? So what I want to do is I'm going to spend a few moments just talking a little bit about the history of consciousness as it's developed since we became a separate species, a separate identified species, roughly 300,000 years ago. Most of you know that the, the ancestors of human, human beings started roughly two million years ago, the, the, the species called the hominids, and there were many, many varieties of pre-humans or proto-humans, but around 300,000 years ago, the species that we are part of, called Homo sapiens, became identifiably separate from all the other hominid species. And of course, we're the only one left of all those species that existed over those millions of years. And People who have studied developmental psychology and developmental evol or evolutionary development have noticed that there are roughly four phases of consciousness that humanity has gone through since the very beginning. And I want to share that because I want us to see what that trajectory might look like. Because each level of consciousness, each new level of consciousness builds on and includes what came before, but brings a new element in that didn't exist before. So there's, there's this element of novelty that's occurred over the past 300,000 years uh, since our species began. I promise you that if we were able to go back 300,000 years and we were to meet ourselves at the very beginning, we would not be able to communicate. We might look relatively the same, and if we were to do genetic analysis, we'd be pretty much the same. But what we can see and understand and experience and discuss and communicate would not have been available to our earliest ancestors. So there's been a lot of change. And here's one of the things that I think is uh, pretty interesting for us to understand this today is that it turns out that the phases of consciousness that the species has gone through since the beginning are the exact same phases that we go through through our individual development. So it's a similar thing if you could meet yourself at age one, you would not be able to communicate with yourself at age one. There's way, way, so, there's way, way so much more growth and consciousness and capability that our little one-year-old, we could hold and communicate and love and so forth, but we couldn't have a conversation with him or her. So that's, as we, as we look at how our species has developed, that's an image to keep in mind, and I'll just go back and forth between what's happened to us as a species and how that's happened to us in our own individual lives. So, so 300,000 years ago, we, the, the, the images, we fell out of the trees in the Great Rift Valley of Africa, and we began to slowly, surely spread out and take over the whole, or to move into the entire globe. And what were we doing 300,000 years ago to make ends meet? Well, we were just simply using whatever food sources were in our local neighborhood in order to survive. And what, what was happening is that we eventually became a, a clan-based community, and there were roughly 40 of us. And we would hang out in a particular area until all the food sources had been exhausted or they became too difficult to get, and we would just get up and move, go somewhere else. 
And this period of our history was called the Paleolithic. It was called the hunter-gatherer phase. And it went on for thousands and thousands of years. And so the level of consciousness that we had to make it through those days was what developmentalists call simple consciousness. The evidence is it wasn't even self-reflexive consciousness in the sense that we were aware of being aware. And you can see this in your own life. So when we were born, there were two or three or four years, it varies for each of us, some people even five or six years, when we were certainly conscious, but we weren't aware of being conscious. conscious. And the way that we can demonstrate that is you just think in your life, when is the first thing you remember? How old were you when you can remember the first thing that happened to you? For some people, it might be as early as one. For me, it's about four. I have no, I have no conscious memories of anything that happened in my life until I was four. Now, ap- after four, I can remember stuff. I have pictures of things that happened. So we were aware. I was born aware. You were born aware. But we weren't aware of being aware. And at some point in our lives, it was like a light turned on. And then we started becoming aware. And we have memories. And we, we, we were able to create images of ourselves through those memories. And now we have what's then called, what's called self-reflexive consciousness. But in simple consciousness, we're capable of, particularly as our species, we are capable of, of taking care of ourselves. We developed tools and we found simple ways to uh, survive. We developed art. The cave art in, in uh, places like Lascaux in uh, France demonstrate that we also had Uh, some uh, rudimentary capabilities to uh, reflect. But you'll notice, if you ever look at any of that art, you'll notice it's all one-dimensional, it's flat. We didn't discover perspective in art until roughly the Renaissance, so that says something about our consciousness. So for 300,000 years, I'm sorry, for 288,000 years, we lived in simple consciousness. But like the acorn of an oak tree, Development was occurring. We just couldn't see it. But we can now look back and see that it was occurring because after the end of the Ice Age, roughly 12,000 years ago, all over the globe, within 2,000 years, agriculture was developed. And we changed, which is in evolutionary time, the blink of an eye, we changed our mode from hunter-gathering, getting up and following food sources, to being able to create food sources ourselves. And the level of consciousness that we needed in order to be, to be gathered together in a group of people and grow food, store it, defend it, changed dramatically. And so we moved to a new level of consciousness. We had to be able to see ourselves as what, what it, developmentalists call part of a tribe. So we went from small clans to larger tribes, and eventually these tribes got so large, we would even call them empires. And essentially, for example, the Roman Empire was just a huge tribe. The Chinese Empire, the Han, the Han Dynasty, these were just huge tribes. That were, and that's pretty much our mode of existence and consciousness from roughly 12,000 years ago until about 500 years ago. So what characterized that? Well, the tribe, in order to survive, had to have every member of the tribe doing its role. Some people were, uh, took care of the animals, some people did the farming, some people took care of the children, Some people did the defense, some people made the weaponry, some people were on lookout. But in order for the tribe to survive, everyone had a role, and everyone had to perform it. And when we look back from a cultural perspective, this was also the time when the great myths that uh, many of us are aware of arose, and the era of the mythic gods. And the tribe's gods took care of them as long as the tribal members followed the rules, God would take care of you. When you didn't follow the rules, God would get angry, and droughts would come, or natural phenomena would occur that we would interpret as we did something wrong, and we have to appease the gods to take care of ourselves. So this period, um, like I said, started about 12,000 years ago, and it corresponds in our own lives to the period from around that time when we wake up and we have consciousness into our adolescence. And what characterizes this for us is that we're part of a, most of us, if, if we're fortunate enough, we're part of a family group, and so we see ourselves in the family. How many people are the, the oldest of a lot, a lot of kids? So for us oldest, we had a role to play, right? And I can pretty much, everybody who raised his or her hand, I can pretty much tell you as, a, as an oldest kid what our experience was because there's a role that's being played. It's not conscious, 
but we're expected to do certain things. And the youngest kid who got away with everything, who are, you, who are the youngest, yeah, yeah. Della, why am I surprised? The youngest kid's playing a role as well. It's, it's, it's not conscious, but it, you can see it um, when, you, uh, when, you, when you drill down. And then we move into um, adolescence. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But this tribal identity is characterized by what George Orwell called groupthink. We all have to think the same thing, and anyone who thinks something different is endangering the tribe. Anybody who wants to stand out of the tribe endangers the tribe by undermining the cohesion of the tribe, by undermining the group beliefs that are what keep us all together, keep us safe, keep food on our table, uh, keep us, uh, have enough security to raise our children so that the next generation can eventually take over. In an adolescence, we see this, this reflected in that need, I may be the only one who had this, but maybe some others of us had that need to be in the in crowd when we were in high school, and how devastated we would feel if we weren't included, how devastating it was to go to a, 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 a sporting event and they picked up sides and every, somebody would get picked, and to be picked last is like the most horrible thing on the planet. That's tribal consciousness. You want to be part of the crowd, and anything that, that prevents you from being part of the crowd is devastating psychologically. And in them days, it could also be you could just die. And oftentimes, if you uh, split from the crowd, and you can see this today in, because tribal awareness actually still dominates on our planet. Anybody who, uh, who is against the orthodoxy could end up being killed. I think of that, that uh, uh, incident that occurred in Kabul uh, after the U.S. got into Afghanistan, and there was a young lady who decided she wanted to convert to Christianity. And she had to leave the country because everyone wanted to kill her because she was splitting from the group belief in, in Islam. So tribal consciousness is powerful. It's what we're, it's been around for a long time. And it's what we are, uh, that's what our mostly, most of our collective experience on the planet right now is still in tribal consciousness. Only about 30% of the 7 billion people on the planet live in cultures that have gone to the next phase. And the next phase is what we call modern individual consciousness. So if in the tribal phase, the sense of identity which emerged at that time was, I am my tribe. And think about that again as the adolescent. I'm my crowd, and I, everything I do is, is to make sure that I'm part of the crowd. The next phase of consciousness is, no, I'm this individual body-mind. I stand apart from any other group. I'm my own person. I'm my own man. I'm my own woman. Um, and this is a complete change from what happened before. And it only started in noticeable numbers of us about 500 years ago. It started formally in the Renaissance, um, and then practically with Martin Luther and the Protestant Re Re Reformation. If you remember, anybody a Lutheran? Very oh, one, two people, okay. Martin Luther's innovation was the priesthood of believers. Every one of us is directly related to God, and we need no intervention from a priest, from... The, uh, from anybody else, we have a direct relation. Well, that corresponds to the revolution that shows up in the Bible, which I'll talk about in a minute, of what Jesus the Christ said. So Jesus said the exact same thing. We are all divine children of God, and we, we don't need anybody to be in relationship with God. All we need is our yes. So this, uh, this period in history, from starting 500 years ago, uh, was the period of what Carl Jung called individuation. And that's our experience. So we live in a modern culture. In fact, the United States of America is the only country that was founded explicitly on modern Enlightenment principles. When you read the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution of the United States, you see all of these things are part of what we said 200-odd years ago that we wanted to become. Every other country in the world came out of the tribal consciousness. Um, and still, many of, many of us still struggle with that, as I'll indicate. Because look what happens in adolescence. 13, 14, we want to be part of the crowd. 15, 16, something else starts to show up for us, and that something else is the urge to be our own person, the urge to become an adult. 
and I want to go do my own thing. So adolescence is quite confusing and difficult for many of us because we feel torn. On the one hand, we want to be part of the group. On the other hand, we want to be our own person. We want to stand out from the crowd. And that's a tough, for, for many of us, you might remember those days, and some of us may want to repress those memories, but that's a, tough, that's a tough thing. Well, that's what the human race has been going through for the past 500 years. Some of us want to become adults, and we want to become autonomous individuals, and many of us still want to be part of the tribe and stay, um, stay uh, in that safe uh, environment, or what appears to us to be a safe environment. The genius of the New Thought Movement is that it's entirely devoted to supporting each of us becoming our own per person, to assisting us to discover our purpose and develop the capacity to go and play there, to play in what it is I'm here to do, and to feel completely free to do that without anybody else's opinion making any difference whatsoever. And this is kind of interesting to me historically. It's no accident that New Thought emerged after the Civil War in the United States because it was here in the U.S. where industrialization really took off and investment in education and scientific discoveries accelerated. And in order for those kinds of things to occur, people have to be free to explore and to think on their own. They, we, can't be, we can't be boxed in by church orthodoxy that says you can only study this and you can only come up with this answer. In the U.S., we were like, no, no, we're, we're, this country is founded so that we're all free to pursue our own happiness. And it's also telling that the widespread use of the word science in New Thought, um, Christian science, science of mind, divine science, etc., which signified a breakthrough in human self-development. The, or, the originators of New Thought, Quimby and Mary Baker Eddy, Emma Curtis Hopkins, the Fillmores, Ernest Holmes, etc., had become aware that we might be able to apply modern scientific methods to human personal and spiritual development. And that was the world that we lived in, our ancestors lived in 200 years ago, in post-Civil War America. And this could only have occurred in America because at that time, America was the only country in the world. England, Holland, and a few others in Europe were, were moving in the same direction. But America was the home of what some have later derided as rugged individualism. When you come to this country, or when you grow up in this country, you're not only encouraged to make it on your own, expected to make it on your own. And you can see that in our cultural values. So I'll talk about that in just a second here. Only individuals liberated from the prejudices and narrow-mindedness of pre-modern tribalism could venture into previously unexplored regions and do it as they choose to do it. The medieval Christian church burned its heretics. Modern Christianity encouraged idiosyncratic in inquiries into any and all aspects of our relationship of God to God and our world. And I reflected it's no accident it's in the U.S. that uh, we have more Christian sects than any other Christian country in the world. This is because there's enormous freedom to explore here because this is a nation com com committed to individual consciousness. But... As Suzanne said, indicated in, in, in her meditation, we all know that there's way more to it than this individual consciousness. And so the question is, where are we going? If God is everywhere present, so too is consciousness, and just so too is love. So the next phase, as I suggest, is into the collective consciousness, from I am this particular individual body-mind to I am humanity. So that it's no longer, it, I've, I've lived long enough to become a free individual, and once I get there, I'm ready to expand and get out of that and move into something much more, much more powerful. And this is what Charles Fillmore called the race consciousness, which he says is formed of thought currents and dominant beliefs of all the people. But so far, I would say that the truth is this is the collective subconscious because we're not really aware of that. We're not, we don't see how it's happening. It doesn't, nothing draws our attention to it. We're like fish in water. If you're a fish in water, nothing draws your attention to water. But it's there, and without it, you, we wouldn't, we wouldn't uh, be sustained. The, the collective consciousness is everywhere present. It's in our politics, our culture, our values. It's in our addictions, our taboos. It's even in our senses of humor. There are things in certain cultures that people find funny that people in other cultures don't find funny. Why is that? 
It isn't an individual decision, it's a collective decision, none of which we have studied, nor do we understand how that emerged, but we see its effects from there. So the collective consciousness is what we can begin to want to access now. And I tell you this, here's the bad news, I have no idea how this is going to happen. You can see it's there, you can see its effects. So for example, how many of you have the experience of your spouse or your child or somebody that your best friend starts a sentence and you complete it? How does that happen? Or how is it that I can look at, uh, I can see Rhoda and when I can see in her face and I say, hey, what's wrong? What's going on? How is it that we can communicate without words? There is a field, which is the collective consciousness, in which we are both participating as one. So again, we can see the effects of the collective consciousness, but it's hard to see it from the outside because we're always in it. So we have to come to individual awareness first in order to open our possibilities to, the, to accessing this collective consciousness. This is because, as Jesus demonstrates through his death, resurrection, and ascension, transformation is only available at this level to those who say yes to it. Surrender to a higher identity is a choice. The freedom to say yes is the gift of individuation. A tribe can't say yes. An individual, let me say, say, say there, but an individual and a tribe can't say yes, only the tribe can say yes. You can't say no when the tribe is saying yes, and you can't say yes if the tribe is saying no. Only a free individual has the capability of doing that. Just a couple of observations, though. We can't, we can't get there through thinking. We don't share brains. And we can't get there through emotions. We don't share guts. So there's something else going on, and again, we're so early in taking a look at this, we really don't have a name for it. We're just going to have to figure out how to experience it. So the good news, though, is some things we can say about it. The principles that we study here in Unity for our own self-development are equally available to us collectively for our collective self-development. The principles of affirmation and denial that work for each of us work for all of us. The challenges that brought us to unity, I talked about them at the beginning, relationship challenges, financial challenges, health challenges, these are common human challenges. They weren't just mine. Every one of us has this experience, and the experience of these challenges is the same experience. There's God mind, it's the same mind everywhere. The human experience is the same everywhere. So the solutions that work for us individually also work for us collectively. In Matthew 18, verses 19 to 20, Jesus says, Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Now it's not that... It's not that God's presence isn't available to us individually, but something happens when we access this two or more principle. As Jesus said, when two or more shall agree on earth as touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done to them. It shall be done unto them. I had this incredibly powerful explanation of how all this shows up in a metaphysical interpretation of the Bible, but we don't have time for that. So uh, that will be another lesson. Sorry. It only took me 18 minutes to do this when I rehearsed it, but it doesn't work that way. But I do want to end with something that is said in the last book of the Bible. The first book of the Bible talks about creation and how consciousness arose in the Garden of Eden by choosing, by Adam and Eve choosing to eat the tree of knowledge, and they became conscious. So just as in the earliest phases of our 300,000 years ago, we didn't have reflective consciousness, Adam and Eve didn't have it either until they ate the apple and saw they were naked. They didn't know they were naked until they ate the apple. They weren't aware of themselves, and they became aware. And they had to go live in a tribe, the Hebrews, that had a covenant with God to take care of them. If they followed the rules, God would take care of them. And how many times did those stupid Hebrews stop following the rules? And how many times did God have to send them into exile in Egypt and Babylon and have Jeremiah and Elijah and all these people warn them? Tribal consciousness. Then Jesus comes along and says, no, everybody, everybody's in. Not just Hebrews, everybody. And then Jesus died and resurrected into this higher consciousness. He showed us the way how to get there. But at the end, 
the book of Revelation, which, con which confuses most of us, because it seems so apocalyptic. Oh, yes, that's why it's called the Apocalypse. In the, last, the second to last chapter, John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had disappeared, and there was no sea anymore. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It was prepared like a bride dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, and this is what God now says, this is the collective consciousness being called forth, now God's presence is with people, not with individuals, with people. And he will live with them, and he will be his people. Out of the collective will, will, will emerge God, or God and the people are one. God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, sadness, crying, or pain, because all the old ways are gone. So this is, this is the promise that the Bible is pointing the way for us all, that there's something much more powerful available to us when two or more are gathered. There's, and again, we don't know how that's going to work, but I would like to close with a little bit of an experiential opportunity for us to feel this. So we've never done this before, but I trust that we can do this. I'd like all of us to stand up and form a circle around the outside of the chairs. Could we do that? Now, we're not in tribal consciousness, so you can say no. So let's do this. First of all, put your hands to your side and put your thumbs left, both hands, and now grab the hand of the person to either side. Thumbs left. There you go. So let's just take a deep breath. Somebody let Jan in. Come on. And take a look around the room. Look into the eyes of our brothers and sisters. Actually, look into the eyes of God looking back at us. Now let's close our eyes, and let's move our attention to our heart space and, and feel the door of your heart opening wide and feel the love energy in there. Now take that love energy and send it to the person to the left and just feel what's going to happen. The love energy that's circulating in the room is expressing itself in a way that we feel in our bodies, we can interpret in our brains, but it's something much more powerful. This love energy circulating through the circle is the experience of the one. And we are collectively creating this and generating this because we chose to. We said, yes, we will do this. So let's close with a prayer. Divine Presence, we thank you that you have created yourself through an evolutionary process that started out very simply but has grown and deepened into a much more complex and loving opportunity for freedom, for joy, for breakthrough. Not only can we, self, not only can we express ourselves freely as individuals, but the next step for us is for humanity to express itself fully and powerfully equally as the human race as a race of people who have lived up to our fullest potential as your children, so that the promise of New Jerusalem becomes available to every man, woman, and child on this planet. And we know it won't happen until everybody's there. None of us is transformed till all of us is transformed. And for teaching us the power of this, for helping us learn to access this, we are so grateful. Let's say together three times, thank you, God. Together, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. All right. We can go back to our seats. <laughs> Tribal collective conscience says you have to go back to the same seat. <laughs> <laughs>